Yeah, my name's Dom Heffer. Uh, I'm a painter based in England. Uh, and what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is just uh, show a painting in progress made for this symposium. And I want to pause it at certain points uh, just to expand upon ideas and methodologies uh, that I feel run parallel with uh, general semantics orientations. Um, I'd really like to place the emphasis on non-verbal levels, if, if possible, so I'll try not to talk and explain too much, because uh, I hope that the images will do most of the talking. Um, the title of the piece, The Canvas is Not the Territory, is meant to suggest that although painting may be this kind of uh, map of the mind, like some kind of cerebral cartography, um, it's important to remember how the mind is in constant flux and we do not have access to all areas at once. Now, the film attempts to depict what goes on between the two poles idea and reality, uh, or how things get from here to here. Or to put it another way, it's about the adjustment of ideas to facts. I think that painting can be a good example of time binding. I think it can show in a succinct fashion where a painter may have picked up from where other painters may have left off. So you may notice in this film nuances of artists like the American painter Philip Guston, uh, maybe a bit of Francis Bacon and David Lynch, perhaps. Hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Philip Guston used to refer to his work as deliberation in paint, and I, I love this approach, this idea of uh, working things out through paint, uh, almost using paint to think. Okay, a bit of a science fiction diversion here. I was thinking about uh, what a well-adapted super evaluating organism might actually look like uh, and apparently it's somewhere between Errol Flynn, <laughs> a bit of a smurf and uh, an octopus. <laughs> okay, stop there. I thought it may be useful to include these visual prompts uh, so I made sure I'd remember to stop the film. Uh, at this point we've already been through a number of guises so I think it'd be useful to draw upon science and sanity to highlight what, for me, is a central affinity uh, between general semantics and a painter's process. Uh, in the chapter, Mathematics as a Language of a Structure Similar to the Structure of the Human Nervous System, Korzybski writes, the world, ourselves included, can be considered as processes which can be analysed in terms of transformed stages with all their derivative notions. In the objective world, change is ever-present and is, perhaps, the most important structural characteristic of our experience. Well, obviously, this resonated hugely with me when I first read it, because for me, in painting, the change is the work, and the painter becomes a kind of medium for change. And I feel convinced that this process develops an essential kind of knowledge, uh, maybe a visual knowledge, to use Charles Biederman's term. But this methodology also seems essential for the honing reconstructing, demolishing and rebuilding of the creative mind into a new kind of thinking tool. Um, in his 1940 book, uh, Le Pro Philosophy du Nom, uh, writing of Korzybski's work, the French philosopher Gaston Bachelard writes, we must realise that when we acquire knowledge of a new kind, we automatically turn the mind into a new thinking tool. Painting seems to me pretty unique as a language or tool and its potential to blend the inner world of thought processes with the outer world of tangible stuff and objects in a kind of um, organism as a whole process. If developed, I think this leads to a fresh evaluation which has the attribute of being able to incorporate self-critique, and this critical element is positive rather than negative and can be integrated into the work in an additive manner. Uh, demonstrating a healthy, self-reflexive dialogue between the painter and his or her actions. I think by this time in the work, the cogs were starting to grind a bit. You know, the ideas weren't flowing as freely as I would have liked. Uh, maybe I was too consciously searching for a revitalising agent of change, and I felt like uh, my cognitions needed oiling. <laughs> uh, but I'm sure we've all felt like that, maybe a few of us this afternoon. I think maybe a brief note on media would be pertinent. You know, the fact that filming a painting <coughs> alters it and imbues it with new potentials and drawbacks as well. I mean, it's important to remember that this painting also exists as an object, 125 centimetres, 
by 100 centimetres by 28 days in 2011. Um, but by recording the painting on its journey, the process of painting can be laid bare in a, in a, sequ a sequential manner. Um, and I think that the, the result is that this converts the painting from what Marshall McLuhan calls a cool medium, one that leaves much to be filled in by the viewer, into a hot medium, uh, where lots is given in a more intensive manner, and perhaps the audience is a bit more subjugated uh, or less participatory. I'm sure that there might be bits that you miss while I'm talking, talking and the images are going on and I'm throwing all this information out there. It feels a bit like each different stage um, of the painting or each image uh, could stand as a painterly proposition on its own. So the film could be seen as many, many paintings compressed. I think in many ways it could be seen as a, a multi-ordinal painting. Korzybski's term, consciousness of abstraction, defined as an awareness of characteristics left out of our experience or the remembering of the is not, is to me a vital state of awareness during painting and I feel that it's actively encouraged through the process of painting because you, you throw all these different forms uh, and objects at this flat surface and only a handful of them stick. And even if they do stick, uh, they may be painted over and only leave a trace. Um, to use Korzybski's words, we are now able to define consciousness of abstracting in simpler terms, namely in terms of memory. The term memory is structurally a physico-chemical term. It implies that the events are interconnected and that everything in this world influences everything else and that happenings leave some traces somewhere. Well, one of the most, one of the most useful things I've learned working on this piece uh, was that these traces or memories could be left visible. So in a way, the, the painting doesn't deny its past. Here's Count Alfred. Okay, so this was a period where I was spending a lot of time sitting and brooding over this piece of work, just looking, thinking rather than acting, and in an upsurge of frustration in my studio, I exclaimed to myself, you trying to hatch an egg? <laughs> and this provided me with uh, an impetus to start painting again. Um, I think this balance between thinking and doing uh, seems an important part of the creative process, because uh, it's essential to think about what you do in order to make a painting, you have to paint. I mean, this sounds obvious, but for me, it's easy to forget. Uh, I aim for at least 50% of the equation being physical activity. Um, obviously, everyone works in their own way. I know painters who spend eight hours a day in the studio and paint for about 30 minutes, but I think a balance between thought and action is a good thing to aim at. Uh, there are scores of works that I've thought about but never actually made, and they never seem to get through the filter. Um, I suppose we could say these have been left out, but not totally left out of my experience. But the objective is uh, to make a painting and not simply to think one. Okay, we now enter the re-evaluation stage of the project. We have my graph of satisfaction <laughs> and the aimometer. <laughs> As can be seen, in the graph, the horizontal axis represents the timeline of days spent working on the project. The vertical axis charts the levels of satisfaction of the work going from very high to oh dear. Um, as we can see, the levels of satisfaction actually plummeted. Uh, the aimometer is meant to make me think about how close I got to the feel of what I wanted to achieve, uh, a bit like a dartboard where you're continually aiming at the bullseye. Uh, but here we see that mark was not quite hit. Um, but I think that's maybe impossible anyway. I like to think that painting can probe or at least provoke what Korzybski called the structural unconscious. Um, in Science and Sanity, in the chapter Unsanity versus Sanity, he describes how this structural unconscious embodies the underlying structural assumptions and implications which are silently hidden behind our languages and their structures. These assumptions may be called unconscious 
because they are totally unknown and unsuspected unless uncovered after painful research. Well, I'd rather refer to painting as challenging research, um, but by facilitating change in between the poles of idea and reality, I think you can embrace the unsuspected and find clues which may point us in the direction of these underlying structures. I had the tremendous feeling whilst working on this piece that um, the vessel could never be filled, it could go on infinitely. Uh, the painting, the ideas almost refused to stop where they were. But I'd like to stop um, with this little adage from Zen Buddhism, which I'm sure some of you may have heard. Uh, the wind was flapping a temple flag. Two monks were arguing about it. One said the flag was moving. The other said that the wind was moving. Arguing back and forth, they could not reach agreement. But then the patriarch came along and said, it is neither the wind nor the flag that is moving. It is your mind that is moving. Um, if you want to see this film again, it's going to be posted on the website, Ideas in the Void. There's some postcards dotted around uh, if any of you need that address. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.